Good morning, uh, everyone uh, who is joining us for uh, this EU plant uh, webinar. Um, welcome or good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever uh, you are joining us from. I'm assuming that this is uh, from all over the world, so uh, you're all uh, most uh, welcome. Um, so today we're having an EU plant uh, webinar, which also uh, serves as the before last uh, lecture of our uh, Chinese law course at uh, the law faculty of KU Leuven on the principle of one country, two systems uh, in the Chinese constitutional law and its operation in Hong Kong. Uh, I should uh, perhaps first say something about the EU plant uh, project and network. EU plant is um, a Jean Monnet funded uh, network or project uh, which deals with uh, judicial and legal cooperation uh, between China and uh, the European Union. And it is comprised of a, a consortium of different universities spread out over Europe, including uh, Queen Mary University of London, King's College London, KU Leuven. And then uh, in China, we also have several universities uh, cooperating, including City University of Hong Kong, um, of which uh, Professor Lin is a uh, member. Now, um, let me introduce you uh, to the topic first. Uh, you may have uh, read the abstract in uh, the invitation, so you can already see what to expect there. Um, and I think it is uh, in particular in these circumstances where a lot of the news today is dominated worldwide by uh, the coronavirus uh, and reporting thereon. Um, and a lot of news uh, related to the coronavirus obviously uh, has to do or comes from uh, China as well. However, you may have noticed that um, in Hong Kong, just uh, on Labor Day, so May 1st, there were again uh, riots. Um, you might remember the riots of uh, 2019 and early 2020. Uh, which got seriously out of hand uh, with the Hong Kong protesters presenting five demands. And obviously these protests are related to uh, the one country, two systems uh, principle, um, as it is a Chinese constitutional principle. And Professor Lin will shed light on how this principle works, what it entails and how it operates in um, Hong Kong. Now, uh, he will also uh, focus on the basic law, from what I've understood, the Hong Kong basic law, which is, of course, the constitutive document, if you, wish, if you will, which sets out the relationship uh, between uh, the special administrative region of Hong Kong and uh, the central government um, in uh, Beijing. So a highly topical uh, issue, uh, which Professor Lin uh, will shed light on. It is also part um, of his uh, field of expertise, I should say. Um, so let me now introduce uh, the speaker. Professor Lin Feng is, as I have said, a professor of law at the City University of Hong Kong. He's also a practicing barrister uh, in Hong Kong. He's originally from mainland China and he holds degrees from Fudan University and also the Victoria uh, University of Wellington from New Zealand, where he is actually joining us from now. He's in uh, New Zealand and he holds a PhD from uh, Beijing University. And as I've said, his specialization lies with the Hong Kong basic law and Chinese and comparative uh, constitutional and administrative law. Now, um, before I leave the floor to uh, Professor Lin uh, to present uh, his talk, just uh, a brief um, uh, update, I would say, on uh, the structure and format of this webinar. So what we will do is Professor Lin will speak in total for about an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes, after which we will leave time for Q&A. Now, in order to have this Q&A uh, take place in an orderly fashion, I would kindly like to ask you to uh, present any questions you have in the chat box, the chat function, um, where you can uh, input your questions as they come along. So you do not have to wait until we start with the Q&A just write them in the chat box uh, as soon as they pop up and we will deal, uh, I will present the questions to Professor Lin at the time of the Q&A uh, at the end of the lecture. Um, and Professor Lin has also said that he will include a short five minute uh, coffee or sanitary break uh, somewhere along the way as well. And finally, uh, as you uh, are probably now accustomed to in these kinds of online meetings, Please keep your uh, microphones and cameras muted at all times. 
um, unless perhaps in the Q&A if you want to clarify something. Um, and if there are any technical issues whatsoever, uh, please do not hesitate to also uh, write them to me, uh, be it privately or publicly, in the chat function. And now I've taken already up way too much time of Professor Lin's uh, speaking time. So Professor Lin, thank you very much for joining us under these uh, difficult circumstances, for sure. Uh, and I leave it entirely up to you. Okay, thank you, Amata, for your kind uh, introduction. And it's my pleasure to uh, join the uh, EU plant project and also uh, honored to me to be invited to give a lecture to uh, uh, Leuven uh, on this uh, in the Chinese law course on this particular topic. Uh, the title I've chosen is the principle of one country, two systems in Chinese constitutional law and uh, its operation in Hong Kong. So, the reason I choose this is because it's uh, the most fascinating aspect of uh, the Chinese constitutional law in the sense that uh, it is actually implemented uh, in Hong Kong, whereas by implemented, I mean the uh, litigated in courts, because we all know uh, the Chinese constitution cannot be litigated uh, in Chinese courts. So that's a, a live uh, constitutional document. Okay. And uh, the arrangement is as follows. Well, I, I will give a brief uh, introduction to the historical background. And then uh, to talk about the incorporation of the principle into the Chinese constitution and uh, give a bit of no knowledge or the basic information about the Chinese essential characters or features of Chinese constitution and its implications. Then we'll say a bit more about the Hong Kong basic law and particularly the uh, how the principle of one country, two systems has been incorporated uh, into the basic law okay, and show you some uh, or lead you to some specific uh, constitution, the basic law articles. So then I will have chosen four specific issues arising uh, from the implementation of the basic law. Okay. Let's see how, how many I can uh, cover uh, during the time. Okay. And uh, finally give uh, a few uh, concluding remarks as conclusion. Okay. So that's how it's arranged. So if you look at, when we talk about one country, two systems, and primarily the principle is applied to, uh, first to Hong Kong, then Macau, and hopefully they will also apply to Taiwan if it's going to uh, be returned or get united with mainland China. So Hong Kong's history, I don't know uh, how, how many of you are familiar with it, but I just mentioned briefly about it. So Hong if you look at the Hong Kong status, it was a British colony since the uh, 1842. And uh, through actually three treaties. Uh, the first treaty is the Treaty of Nanking or Nanjing uh, after the uh, Opium War. And that treaty, uh, or through that treaty, uh, Hong Kong Island was uh, ceded to UK. And actually, uh, UK took possession of it a couple of years before that. Okay, so that's the that's a secession and the Hong Kong Island. And then, in 1860, another treaty was signed. The first called the first Convention uh, of uh, Peking. That convention ceded a uh, Kowloon Peninsula to UK. Okay. And if you've been to Hong Kong you will know that there is a street called Boundary Street. Actually, on um, the, uh, let me see, which uh, southern side of the Boundary Street uh, was the former uh, Colon Peninsula. So that one was ceded uh, to uh, UK in 1860. And then uh, in 1898, the first convention of Beijing was actually extended and which was called the Second Convention. And through 
the second convention of Peking, uh, the new territories were leased to UK for 99 uh, years. Okay. So two parts were ceded and uh, the last part, new territories, was leased uh, for 99 years. And uh, the, if you look at the portion of it, the new territories, uh, the the territory in the new territories is about 90% of the total territory in Hong Kong. Okay. So that was actually part of the reason why UK cannot insist that the Hong Kong should be uh, governed by uh, UK after 1997. Because with even assuming those all the treaties are uh, lawful under international law, but with only 10% of the uh, territory, it's not economically viable. But there, the three treaties, Chinese official position is that the three, they say the three treaties are unequal treaties. And therefore they don't recognize them as lawful treaties. But nevertheless, they recognize the governance or administration of UK uh, actual occupation of Hong, Hong Kong. Okay. And then what UK did was after taking over Hong Kong as its colony and decided to apply all British law or actually extended all British law to Hong Kong as part of uh, Hong Kong's uh, law. So that's how Hong Kong has got the uh, British uh, common law system. So later, I will, I'm going to talk a bit more about it because when we talk about one country, two systems, uh, one part of the system or the difference of the system is the legal system. Hong Kong practices common law system, whereas uh, China practice the, uh, the civil law system with Chinese characteristics. Okay. So then by the uh, 19... 80s, actually early 1980s, uh, the two countries, actually UK, started to discuss the issue with China about the future of Hong Kong. And they wanted to actually keep uh, Hong Kong under its administration. And but through the negotiation, and at that time, Deng Xiaoping said, the issue of sovereignty is not negotiable. Okay. Not negotiable. So eventually they agreed to return uh, Hong Kong back to China. And uh, it's, what I've listed here are the three things they've uh, agreed. Okay. UK will return Hong Kong to China, the whole three parts. Okay. And uh, China agreed to keep Hong Kong's status and its uh, system or systems for 50 years without any, without substantial change. Okay. So maintain the, uh, basically the status quo for uh, 50 years. And uh, to the uh, John Declaration, actually there are three uh, annexes. And uh, one, annex one is about China's basic policies regarding Hong Kong. So those actually later on have been incorporated into uh, the basic law of Hong Kong. Okay. And Annex 2 is about the uh, Joint Liaison Committee. Okay. That committee was set up to prepare the uh, transition okay, in 1997. Okay. And uh, the last Annex is about uh, land leases because land is the most important uh, assets in, in Hong Kong. It's very expensive. So they have a spatial uh, annex uh, about this. So if you paid attention to uh, Hong Kong or discussions or reportings in newspapers about Hong Kong, you will know that uh, some time ago, uh, some Chinese officials have raised the point that the joint declaration is no longer valid. Okay. And, uh, but the position taken by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was actually correct. What they said was they 
joint declaration is a valid bilateral agreement. So that's the position. And other, some other uh, governmental officials in other ministries said it's no longer valid. I guess purely because uh, they, they're not experts in law. Okay. So whereas foreign, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is the ministry which uh, deals with uh, this issue. So their position or statement was actually the correct one. So then, let's. So that's Hong Kong, and uh, how we've got this principle. We say the one country, two systems. Actually, the, this principle was proposed or raised for, in order to get Taiwan to be united with mainland China. That was the very first or primary purpose when the principle was first uh, raised by another Chinese official, senior official, Ye Jianying, actually, not Deng Xiaoping, okay. But later, uh, Taiwan, of course, was unwilling to uh, get united uh, back uh, at that time. So then the Hong Kong issue raised. So, because in the late 70s and early 1980s of last century, the UK and China started discussions about the future of uh, Hong Kong. So, in the 1982 constitution, which uh, is the second, you can say, no, not the fourth, actually, the fourth uh, formal uh, constitutional document of the People's Republic of China. Okay. So, there is this Article 31. Okay. If you have put it here, okay, on the slide, you can see. This one says that the country or the state may establish SARs if necessary, okay? And the systems to be instituted in special administrative regions shall be prescribed by law enacted by the National People's Congress, okay, in light of the specific uh, conditions. So if you look at the whole, if you go through the whole constitution, and that's the primary uh, constitution article, you can refer to when we talk about the uh, one country, uh, two system uh, in China. So that was the one. Of course, you can also go to uh, the preamble because which says uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, Macau are uh, inseparable uh, part of uh, China. Okay. But this one actually is the primary source for the enactment of the bas basic law later and which is referred to in the basic law uh, specifically. So because we're going to talk about, compare later uh, the two uh, systems, the Chinese constitutional system and the Hong Kong ones, it, it, when we talk about those issues. So I want to uh, give you a brief summary about the main features or basic features of Chinese constitution or constitutional system. So Ch China is a republic, which is, you can see from the uh, name of the country, People's Republic of China. Okay, it's a republic and the constitutional structure, it's a unitary state, okay, not a federal, though some scholars argue that China is actually quasi-federal because of the existence of uh, uh, the two spatial administrative regions and uh, five autonomous regions in China. Okay, but it's officially it's it's unitary. Okay, and it's a socialist state. Okay, or adherence to socialism is regarded as one of the four uh, cardinal principles uh, in Chinese constitutional law. Okay, so that's it's a socialist state. Okay, but if you go deeper into it. And to look at the uh, scholars' definition about socialism, and you you may or scholars may query whether China is actually a socialist state now. Okay, but we we're not going into the, the details of that. The next is the leadership of Chinese Communist Party is written in both the preamble as well as the uh, formal uh, provision of the constitution. 
Yeah, this one is very important in the sense that the leadership has been of the Communist Party has been constitutionalized. Okay. So that actually precludes any other political parties to become a, a ruling party in China. Okay. So without the change, in, without changes to the constitution and no other political parties can become a ruling party in China. Okay. Democratic centralism is another uh, feature in the uh, operation of, of all constitutional uh, organs in China. Okay. And the, also the ideology is the guidance of the Marxism, uh, Leninism. And of course that has been modified in China by the Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, and uh, later on some others. Okay, so that's the ideology aspect, and also it adheres to the people's uh, democratic dictatorship uh, principle. And uh, but this one, uh, scholars have different views, and some have argued that uh, there's inherent in contradiction uh, within this principle, because on the one hand, it talk about democracy, on the other hand, it talk about uh, dictatorship, okay? So that's, uh, those are actually a few things or principles which are quite unique in China, apart from the uh, first two, okay? From three uh, to the uh, seven people's dem democratic uh, dictatorship. So the following ones are actually Following three are common, can I say, sovereignty of people, which is recognized uh, on the Chinese constitution, and the rule of law, which has been incorporated into the constitution, and the protection of uh, fundamental rights. Okay, so you can see all those uh, in Chinese constitution. Okay, but another difference is China does not recognize separation of powers uh, as a constitutional principle though it does recognize uh, there is division of powers uh, among uh, different constitutional organs, okay? but no formal separation of powers because all constitutional organs are actually under the leadership of the Communist Party. Okay? And a new constitutional organ or power which has been uh, established, formally established, established uh, through the 2018 Constitution Amendment. That's the supervisory power and also the establishment of the supervision uh, commission as a separate constitutional organ. So that part will actually have a fundamental impact upon the future uh, of the Chinese constitutional system. And the rationale behind it, why they create this one, is actually that they're trying to uh, borrow something which they think is good, that's the supervision uh, division in, under the traditional Chinese law uh, into the modern constitutional system. But whether that will be successful or not, and it's uh, difficult to say, okay? and, and I haven't done a detailed research on it, uh, that's something I'm going to do later. So those are some essential things. Okay. And then come to the, the next is the, the Chinese constitution we've talked about, and it's Article 31 is the only article we can find, okay, and which is relating to one country to uh, systems. But what's the rele relevance of it, of the, other parts of the constitution or Chinese constitution to Hong Kong, are they relevant? And if you look at the Chinese offici official position is that they say various senior officials said on different occasions and also in formal documents, they say Chinese constitution and the basic law together constitute the fun constitutional foundation uh, of Hong Kong SAR. So that statement, uh, I think is correct, okay? because basically it's based on the constitution. So with the article authorization under third, article 31, then basic law was enacted. And the basic law after its uh, enactment, uh, since 
July the 1st, 1997, has become Hong Kong's constitution. So it's fair to say both of them constitute the constitutional foundation okay, of Hong Kong SAR. But the issue has not been resolved is are other parts of the Chinese constitution relevant to Hong Kong or applicable in Hong Kong? Okay. So that issue, and the scholars have different views. If you ask Chinese scholars, that they've, they've given several different views. The, the leading scholars, um, Hong Kong basic law, the former one, the, the late Professor Xiao Weiyun, for example, from uh, uh, Beida, okay, Peking law, law School. And uh, he said that it's, you cannot identify what articles of the Chinese constitution are applicable in Hong Kong and what are not. Because some articles, he said, only part of it is applicable in Hong Kong. The others are not. So that's one view. And some others, actually there is one article written a few years ago by a scholar from Shanghai. He says, he actually listed what articles are applicable, what are not. Okay. So there are different views okay, on it. So that's a sort of theoretical issue. But practically, and uh, when you apply, actually, in, if you look at all the cases in Hong Kong, you can say, when we talk about the direct application in litigation, it's the basic, basic law itself. Though in judgments, uh, courts uh, would refer to uh, the various articles of the Chinese constitution. Okay. But they are not directly applicable in the sense that you will rely on them to uh, decide a case. Okay. So they will refer to it. So, okay, one country, two systems. Okay, let's come back to this one. So, one country, two systems. So, what's exactly the meaning of one country, two systems? And because most people nowadays, when we talk about one country, two systems, we associate it with uh, Deng Xiaoping, okay, with Deng Xiaoping. And uh, he said the following in a meeting with uh, a delegation from Hong Kong shortly before uh, the signing of the Joint Declaration. Okay. So that's what he said. So he said, essentially, basically it means China or Chinese, mainland Chinese, or mainland China will be ruled under the socialist system, whereas Hong Kong and Taiwan later, if it will be returned, will be ruled under the capitalist system. So at that time, so in his mind is the two different systems there, okay? One is socialist system. Of course, the system covers various, uh, you can say, many systems, okay? And whereas Hong Kong system, categorically, he calls it, it's the, the capitalist system. Okay. So that's what he meant. Basically, it's like an old Chinese saying that the uh, river water would not interfere with the well water. Okay. Two systems or two parts of China, though the sovereignty will be returned, but will be governed separately. Okay. That's the uh, idea. Okay, China, because what China wants essentially is the territorial integrity and the sovereignty, recognition of its sovereignty. Okay. And later, uh, President Jiang Zemin also uh, mentioned this one, about this uh, one country, two system, but by adding a bit more detail, saying that uh, with Hong Kong, we are main, Hong Kong, Macau, we in the capitalist system with the original lifestyle remaining unchanged. Okay. So one change. That's why there's another term we usually use when we talk about Hong Kong is the through train. Because between Hong Kong and uh, Guangzhou, there's a train. So you get on in Hong, Hong Kong and then you, the train will go to Guang, Guangzhou directly. There is no stop at the border. So that was used to uh, compare the transition 
97 transition. So in 97, there will be a through train. Basically, not much change, okay, except the change of the sovereignty. Okay. But later, there is some, uh, because of some issues, the political reforms uh, initiated by the uh, last governor, Chris Patton. So the, some parts of it, mainly the uh, Mexico, there was no through train of uh, the Legislative Council, which is how the legislature, okay. The China had another election, uh, organized another election of the Legislative Council members. Okay. So because of Article 31, and because of the incorporation of the principle of one country, two systems. So that, the implications or the consequences of, of it uh, is the first is the through trend I've mentioned. And the second is Hong Kong after the change of sovereignty in 97, Hong Kong will practice a complete different system. Okay, so that capitalist system include a social, economic, political, and as well as legal a system in it. Okay, and how to do it? Because the joint declaration has incorporated basically the main principles, China's or basic policies about Hong Kong, but no details. So details would be through a law enacted by. China's uh, legislature, the National People's Congress on the NPC. So that's the basic law, okay? So that is, those are a few, I would call the uh, implications of its incorporation, okay? So now let's move on to talk about the uh, Hong Kong basic law, okay? So, and uh, the principle of one country, two systems. So basic law, in my view, it's a, a fascinating uh, constitutional document in the sense that it was enacted by mainland China, which practices a socialist uh, civil law system, but mainly implemented in Hong Kong, which is a common law system. And uh, if you look at the two systems, the Chinese legal system and Hong Kong's uh, common law system. The only meeting point is between the two legal systems is the basic law. Okay. Other laws, if you look at the civil law, if you look at criminal law, procedural law, mm -hmm. administrative law, no connecting point, completely separate. Okay. Whereas the basic law is the meeting point between the two uh, legal systems. And exactly because of that, and uh, of course there are some other things uh, we, which I'm going to talk about later. There are a lot of disputes and uh, legal issues raised, which is actually understandable because two different legal systems, they give different interpretation to uh, the same articles in the basic law. That's how uh, disputes arise. Okay. So later, the four examples I'm going to discuss with you will, will illustrate that. Okay. So, and also in Hong Kong, I think we are very fortunate in the sense that the implementation of the basic law provides rich materials for comparative study. And uh, we are never short of issues for research. Every now and then, and every year, if not every month, there will be new constitutional issues uh, arise and which need to uh, uh, be researched. So the status, let's now come to look at the uh, status of the basic law. It's a national legislation, which I've said, if you look at its hierarchy in Chinese legal system or sources of law, its status is just lower than the Chinese constitution. Okay. But compared with the other laws, 
let me see. Uh, maybe I leave leave it as that. Otherwise, it uh, will be too complicated. But later, we're going to look at uh, one issue. Is so there is Chinese. This Chinese constitution, according to Article Thirty One, we've en enacted the Basic Law, and. Uh, so its status is lower than the constitution. Okay. And uh, as to its application, primarily it's applied in Hong Kong. Okay. But doesn't mean it does not bind the Chinese government because of it's a national law. So Chinese government or different organs of governments in China when they do things or deal with Hong Kong, actually they also need to follow the basic law. So it's binding on all, okay? not only Hong Kong, but also uh, mainland China, okay? or different organs in mainland China. And one issue here, which is an interesting issue, and uh, many articles have been written, but not, I don't think has been properly resolved, is the relationship between the uh, Chinese constitution and the basic law. The reason it is an issue is because many articles in the basic law are in direct contradiction with uh, articles in the constitution. For example, the socialist legal system, okay, a socialist system in China, leadership of the Communist Party, so those don't apply in Hong Kong at all. Okay. So then that leads to a very interesting constitutional issue is this. In theory, the Chinese constitution as the constitution of the whole country, okay, China, which includes Hong Kong, should be applicable in Hong Kong. Okay. But in reality, it's not applicable in the sense that courts in Hong Kong do not rely on Chinese constitution to decide cases. So how to, how to resolve this uh, sort of a con dilemma? Okay? In theory, it should be applied, but in practice, it's not applied. Okay? So that issue, there are various uh, theories as Chinese scholars have raised, but uh, I None of them has resolved this issue satisfactorily. So if you are interested, uh, you can do more research uh, on this. Okay. So here are a couple of slides and what's written uh, in the preamble of the basic law, okay? which is about the, uh, refers specifically to the principle of one country, two systems, and also the status of uh, the basic law, okay? So I wouldn't uh, read it to you. You can read it later to, uh, in details. Let me see, sorry. I... Ah, yeah, this is I want to, later I'm going to discuss this case with you in detail. This is Nkaling case is the very first uh, case decided by the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong relating to the basic law. Okay. And uh, the ambition or the, of the Court of Final Appeal or the Chief Justice at that time, uh, Andrew Lee, was to uh, decide a case similar to the Marbury versus Madison in the United States in the sense he want, wanted through this case to establish a framework for constitutional litigation in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. But, we, but this case has caused a, a lot of disputes, uh, which I will come to talk about uh, in detail later. So if you look at the last sentence on this uh, page, and uh, in the judgment, Chief Justice Lee mentioned, said that the basic law is a national law and it's the constitution of the region region is the Hong Kong SIR, okay. So in Hong Kong, its status is very clear. It's the constitutional document or constitution of Hong Kong, okay. So nobody questions that.
But men, some men and Chinese scholars, they don't agree. They say one country should only have one constitution. So therefore, uh, basic law is not a constitution. So that's a sort of a theoretical argument. If you say one country can only have one constitution, then of course, the only the Chinese constitution is the constitution. But they agree it's the constitutional uh, document uh, for Hong Kong. Okay. So if you use a different word, uh, they, they're happy to accept. Okay. So that's also from the judgment. Uh, so one country principle, if you look at the uh, basic law itself, in the document, primarily, as I said before, reflected through the emphasis on the territorial integrity and the sovereignty. Okay? So Article 1 states very clearly, Hong Kong is, uh, is an inalienable part of PRC. Okay? So the sovereign, the issue about sovereignty, I mentioned that China emphasized very much on sovereignty and uh, uh, territorial integrity. Okay? Those are not negotiable. I've cited here what uh, given to you, uh, uh, said by uh, Deng Xiaoping. Okay. Uh, it actually, during the negotiation process uh, with UK about the uh, future of uh, China. So he stated very clearly, once it's resumed, China resumed sovereignty, then it can actually delegate power to Hong Kong. Okay. So basically, he only wants, or what he essentially wants is the return of sovereignty. Then through the basic law, the authority will be delegated to Hong Kong. So Hong Kong will exercise high degree of autonomy, it's really high degree of autonomy. If you compare that high degree of autonomy, autonomy enjoyed by Hong Kong, which is much broader than uh, many uh, states, uh, or local governments uh, within federal uh, countries. Okay. So here are a few, uh, let me see, examples, articles you can refer to. Legislative power, for example, Hong Kong has its own legislative power. Okay. So apart from some legislations, the basic law and a few Chinese laws uh, in annex, uh, in in Appendix 3 of the Basic Law. So most other areas, or um, in all areas under Hong Kong's, or within Hong Kong's autonomy, it can legislate. Okay. So executive power, again, it's a comprehensive executive power, okay. All matters, okay, uh, within, uh, for Hong Kong to exercise. Independent judiciary, judicial power. So this is very unique, okay in the sense that Hong Kong enjoys the final adjudication authority. So no cases in Hong Kong will be appealed to uh, mainland Chinese Supreme Court. Okay, so all decided here. Okay. And uh, another unique one is the external affairs. External affairs actually is, you can say are part of, if you look at other countries, most countries in the world, external affairs are part of international affairs. So external affairs are actually a unique term created for Hong Kong specifically. Okay. So if you look at international law literature, they are actually part of inter, uh, international affairs or foreign affairs. Okay. But because Hong Kong exercised a lot of authority, like a sort of, for example, participation as members of different international organizations, WTO is one example. Okay. And assigning bilateral agreements with uh, other countries like extradition, extradition agreements or investment agreements, they can all sign. So because they have already signed those and China wants to maintain a sort of a through chain, so they created in the latest basic law unique term, external affairs. So carved part of the foreign affairs for Hong Kong to exercise. So that's essentially the purpose. But they also have the, the very narrow concept of foreign affairs will be subject to, uh, will be, uh, 
you can say active state for the central government to exercise. Okay. So, so that's the, uh, the fourth power. And another one is uh, other powers authorized. Okay. So in addition, so basic law basically takes the approach to list all the powers to be enjoyed by Hong Kong. But then Article 20 says that Hong Kong SAR can also enjoy other powers which will be granted to it by the MPC or its standing committee or the central government. Here central government means the executive branch, okay, the state council. Okay, so, so it can exercise uh, other powers. So you can see the scope of the uh, autonomy is really high. So because of this Article 20, actually, there, there's another issue raised, that's the residual power. Okay? Because there's no provision uh, in the basic law stating specifically that uh, who would enjoy residual power, meaning those powers not defined in the basic law the central government or the local government, or Hong Kong SAR. And many in the Hong Kong SAR, people in Hong Kong arguing that residual power should be enjoyed by Hong Kong if you want to maintain the sort of uh, formal system for 50 years unchanged. Okay, should. But then if you read the Chinese government said no, if you look at their, their reliance is Article 20. They say Article 20 states very clearly any other powers, central government can actually also grant to Hong Kong, okay? uh, grant to Hong Kong if necessary. Okay? So it's implied in Article 20 that residual power is or is with the central government. And their, their position on this is consistent actually over the years. And I, I personally tend to agree uh, with this approach because that's the only article you can say relevant uh, to the residual power. But of course, if you rely on the old practice or the uh, past practice, it could raise some different arguments. One example to support this approach is this uh, uh, 206 decision of the MPC on authorized the Hong Kong SAR to exercise jurisdiction over Hong Kong port area at Shenzhen uh, Bay Port. So this is, if you, I don't know whether you know this, I mentioned to you uh, briefly. Hong, there's a bridge in the western part of Hong Kong, uh, which goes to, uh, connects to uh, Shenzhen, okay, part of Shenzhen. And then the, the idea at that time is to just uh, set up uh, one place where the, the Shenzhen uh, Bay Port area, where the immigration customs control of both mainland China and Hong Kong will be stationed there. Okay. But the problem for that is uh, that part, ter territory, was within mainland China. So Chinese law would apply. But if Hong Kong's immigration and uh, customs uh, will be extended to there, then so long as the people passed the Hong Kong customs uh, and immigration control, then they, will, they should be governed by Hong Kong law. But how can Hong Kong law be applied on mainland Chinese territory? So in order to make it possible, uh, the standing committee made this decision in 2006 to enable, to authorize Hong Kong to exercise jurisdiction in that particular area. Okay. So that is through Article 20, okay, authorization. So that is in, originally Hong Kong should not have jurisdiction over that part but uh, through the authorization of the MPCSC and Hong Kong has obtained extra jurisdiction, or jurisdiction over extra 
a small piece of land uh, in mainland China. Okay. So that's the point. Now, so that's about the sort of uh, general picture about the one country, two system and how the, the two system part, particularly that has been uh, included or provided for under the basic law through different provisions. So now let's move on to talk about a few uh, issues, okay, arising. Uh, over the years in the implementation of the basic law in Hong Kong. So the first is the dispute over uh, interpretation of the basic law. And the interpretation of basic law and particularly the uh, Nkalin case has actually or has almost caused a, a real constitutional crisis. It has caused, a, I would say, caused a crisis, but the crisis didn't further deteriorate. Okay. So I explained to you why. So what happened in this case, the case was, uh, if you look at the facts, not that difficult or complicated. So Nkalin was uh, a child given birth to by a Hong Kong father, okay, but he, the mother was a mainland Chinese, okay? So she was born in mainland China, okay? But shortly before the change of sovereignty on the 1st of July, 97, and somehow her parents managed to bring her to Hong Kong illegally. Actually, there are a group of them. Uh, they came to Hong Kong illegally before the change of sovereignty. But immediately after the change of sovereignty, after the 1st of July, 97, they went to the immigration department to apply for permanent residence under Article 24 of the Basic Law. Okay. So because the Article 24 says, the Article 24 two lists six categories of people who are entitled to the right of vote uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, one of them is actually the children given birth to by uh, Hong Kong permanent residents. Okay. So that's one of them, one category. And uh, she uh, falls within that category. So they went to Hong Kong Immigration Department to apply for permanent residence and by relying on that article, Article 242. And they say, that is our constitutional right, Article 24. Article 24 is in chapter three of the basic law, okay? And chapter three of basic law is actually on fundamental rights okay, and obligations of Hong Kong uh, residents. Okay. So I actually wrote an article to argue that the right of a vote at Article or Article 24 should not be written in the Constitution. Okay, but that's a separate issue. I'm not going to discuss that here in detail. But anyhow, coming back to the interpretation issue or the case, they have applied, but Hong Kong government has said, no, you are not entitled to the right of vote because under the previous system, that is under the immigration ordinance, there are detailed provisions, and one of them saying that if you are a child uh, born by a Hong Kong permanent resident, if you want to become a, come to Hong Kong to reside in Hong Kong, you have to get permission from the Chinese authority first to get the, what we call the one-way permit to leave mainland China, to then, because they actually, uh, for years, uh, British government had an agreement with China that they implement a quota system. So every day, there will be about 150 uh, immigration quota. So every day, 150 
mainland Chinese can immigrate to Hong Kong. Okay. So get the one-way permit is basically to get one of those quotas, then you can come to Hong Kong. Even, so even though before the 1st of July, 97, even a child has a mother or father who is a permanent resident in Hong Kong, and you still need to queue, okay, to queue to get the quota. Okay? And also, you must be, your father or mother must be a permanent resident before you were born. Okay? So those are written in the immigration ordinance. And that was the practice up to July the 1st, 97. But the lawyers, the lawyer for Nkali's argument was that those detailed provisions in the immigration ordinance, their status are lower than the basic law. Article 24 is a constitutional right. Okay? So any statutory provision in local Hong Kong ordinances, if they are inconsistent with the basic law, then they're now and void, should be repealed. So that's their argument. Okay. And so the case went to the Court of Final Appeal okay, through uh, the High Court and then to the uh, Court of Appeal then eventually ended up with the uh, Court of Final Appeal. So the Court of Final Appeal decided actually that if that's my personal view, if they've only decided to give Nkaling and the other applicants the right of voting in Hong Kong, I don't think it would lead to a constitutional crisis. But in addition to that, they said something that the, about their authority to, or put it in this way, the scope of constitutional review for Hong Kong courts. As I said before, that's the whole intention of the uh, Chief Justice Lee at that time. He wants to set up the sort of framework for constitutional uh, review uh, in Hong Kong. So what he said in the case was actually that the basic law, because it's a constitutional document for Hong Kong, a constitution for Hong Kong, that's what he said. So then that constitutional document together with the authorization or grant of independent judicial power enable Hong Kong courts to review any acts or decisions of the NPC and NPCSC to see if they're consistent with the basic law. So basic law is the constitutional document document. No other documents or decisions should be inconsistent with the basic law in Hong Kong. Therefore, it comes to the conclusion that Hong Kong courts should have the power or authority to determine whether there is inconsistency between the basic law on the one hand and any other decisions or legislations of the NPC and NPC. SC, on the other hand. So that was something which the MPCSC was very unhappy about. Because under Chinese constitutional law, who has the authority to de determine the consistency or inconsist inconsistency between different legislations? It's the Standing Committee of MPC, that's the MPCSC. Okay? So Ch even Chinese courts don't have the authority at all. So now Hong Kong courts or the Court of Final Appeal, Court of Final Appeal declares by itself that it has the authority to review to the inconsistency between decisions of MPC and the basic law. So they regarded it as a sort of, you can say, usurpation of their power. So that power belongs to the MPCSC, not the uh, Hong Kong courts. Okay. But that case 
the, what has caused the sort of crisis was that the, after the judgment of the CFA, which is final under the basic law in Hong Kong, okay? And then the chief executive at that time in Hong Kong, Tong Chi Hua, he was very unhappy with the judgment because what they did an estimate, they say, if Hong Kong government will implement this in Kalin case, there would be more than 1.6 million Chinese would be qualified to immigrate to Hong Kong. And that's not something Hong Kong government can actually support, can, does not have the capacity to support that. Too, too many people will come to Hong Kong, which is only uh, a little bit over 1,000 square uh, uh, kilometers. Okay. So then he made a request uh, to the central government uh, to uh, interpret the basic law. Okay, interpret the basic law. Basically, want, want the central government to overrule the uh, Nkalin case. But the, the problem is how to overrule. And the C chief executive did not really have, if you read the back, basic law carefully, chief executive in Hong Kong does not have the authority to request an interpretation of the basic law. So what he did was he asked the state council in China, which is the central government, to seek an interpretation from the MPCSC okay, on the Article 24 of the Basic Law. So that is then the MPCSC issued an interpretation uh, on that article. Article 24 and also Article 22. So that has caused the crisis because the many Hong Kong lawyers, including judges, their view is that they say, if you look at Article 158, that's the article about interpretation, okay? Hong Kong people's understanding or many Hong Kong people's understanding, they say, okay, paragraph one of Article 156, 58 says, MPCSC has the power to interpret, which basically is copied from the Chinese constitution, uh, Article 67, okay? But then paragraph two grants that authority to the courts in Hong Kong, okay? To interpret the basic law on its own, okay? Those provisions of the law, which are within the limits of the autonomy, Okay, those who have the authority to interpret those were granted to Hong Kong. But article, paragraph three of this article 158 says that in addition to those articles within Hong Kong's autonomy, Hong Kong courts can also interpret other articles. Basically those are within the jurisdiction relating to the affairs uh, which are responsibility of the central government or central local relations. So those matters, if they're going to interpret those articles, then they need to seek an interpretation from the MPCSC, okay? If that interpretation will affect the judgment uh, in the end. Okay. So, but in this case, the government lawyer representing the government did not ask the CFA to seek an interpretation. And also because Article 24 is under the chapter about fundamental rights. It's not about the matters uh, within the responsibility of the central government or concerning the relationship between Hong Kong and the central government. So that's why the, the CFA decided the case and without seeking an interpretation because they are of the view that there is no necessity to seek an interpretation and also the government did not ask for an interpretation. Okay. So now they say that's the matter within my fine autonomy. Okay, I can issue a final judgment. But the government didn't like the judgment. So they seek an interpretation from the MPCSC which did issue an interpretation. 
which actually overrule the judgment. Though the judgment, those people involved in the judgment would not be affected, okay, according to uh, this paragraph three. Okay. So then after the interpretation given, so in another point I want to mention is, so actually the first interpretation was given by using the procedure to seek interpretation on the Chinese constitution. Okay. That's the uh, Article 67, and also the organs who can seek interpretation, the state council uh, seek interpretation. So that's uh, under Chinese constitutional law, used that procedure, not, didn't use the procedure under the uh, basic law. Okay. So then after the interpretation was given, actually Hong Kong, the, all the justices of the Court of Final Appeal, they had a meeting and they, decide, they, they discussed whether they should resign collectively. But eventually they decided not to, and which I think was a really wise decision. Because if they did decide to resign, then that would be a much bigger constitutional crisis for Hong Kong. So I think we have a, it's a something we, shall we have a short break for five, five minutes? Yes, indeed, I think uh, that's perhaps a good idea. So it's now uh, 10 past 10. So uh, I suggest we resume at uh, 10.15. So indeed in five minutes, is that all right? Yeah, okay. All right, then we'll okay. see you all back again in uh, about five minutes. Right. Okay, uh, I will continue. So in the uh, Nkaling case, actually before Nkaling, we have another David Mark case. Uh, Hong Kong's courts, the CFA has adopted the uh, common law approach uh, to interpret the basic law. And specifically, it says because it's a constitutional document, so it will adopt the purposive approach to interpret the basic law, uh, which, if you've done constitutional law, you should be uh, familiar with. So the details I wouldn't talk about. Okay, you can read it. I have some uh, excerpts from the judgment. So, but that approach has, is taken by Hong Kong, okay? But China, the, in the interpretation uh, of the MPCSC, it actually for the very first time stated uh, the approach taken by the MPCSC in interpreting a Chinese law which is called the original legislative intent, or in Chinese called the Lifa Yuan Yi, okay, original legislative intent. So that's the approach. But in theory, you can discuss the diff whether there are any differences, uh, which is beyond the scope of my uh, talk today. But that approach after the case, there are actually two very interesting issues. Uh, worthy of uh, further analysis. That is, the first is what articles can the basic law, can the ba uh, basic law can the MPCSC interpret? Okay. So if you, you said one argument essentially is it can only, its interpretation scope is actually limited by paragraph three of article 158. And uh, another approach is that they can interpret more. But actually, if you go through the history, you will see that MPCSC or the Chinese, even Chinese scholars or Chinese government didn't say they, the MPCSC could interpret every article of the basic law. The reason for that is because when they, what they need to interpret is article 24, 2 and 2, 3, okay? But, they interpreted, they included in their interpretation also Article 22.4. The reason is because Article 22 is within the chapter on central local relationship. But Article 24 is under the chapter on fundamental rights. Okay. So they have to lump the, those two together to show that they satisfy the paragraph three uh, requirement. Okay. It's relating to central 
local relationship, central, I mean Chinese uh, central government and the Hong Kong SR relationship. That's why they exercise the interpretation. So from what they've done, you can see that they actually think also war of the view or implied from what they've done. Their interpretation authority was limited to uh, those matters mentioned in paragraph three. Okay. And when the other issue is, when can MPCSC interpret? Okay. So this issue has caused a lot of uh, debate in Hong Kong for the reason that out of five interpretations given by the MPCSC so far, only one did not, which was non-controversial. All four have caused, uh, I wouldn't call all crisis, sort of debate, serious debate uh, in Hong Kong. Okay. So those need to be uh, discussed. Okay. And so, but anyhow, that's the first uh, case. So it's through the overrule interpretation of the MPCSC that the CFS judgment in Kalin was actually overruled, you can say. Okay. The, the ruling okay, on the legal issue was overruled. And then, where is the second case? How come? Yeah, then came the second case later. And here, my focus is on the sort of uh, interpretation authority, okay, where, how it has moved. They, this case, you can, those, I, I discussed three cases with you, which will show you how the CFA has developed its jurisdiction over the interpretation of the basic law, or it's over the, its authority to interpret the basic law. So because its case judgment in the Nkaling has been overruled, okay? And uh, then, but the life continues. So they need to rationalize the relationship between the MPCSC's interpretation and the Nkaling case. Okay. So in the second case, actually in the same year, 1999, okay, the Lo Kong Yong case, they have, the CFA has or changed its position completely, completely. So if you look at the excerpt I've given you here, basically they acknowledge from originally, if you still remember what I've said before, that they said they have the authority to uh, do things, okay? And also the, the authority of interpretation of the MPCSC actually is limited to those matters mentioned under paragraph three of 158. Then coming to this case, they say that MPCSC can interpret any articles of the basic law, any articles. And also that interpretation authority is general and unqualified. And that is way beyond what the MPCSC itself expected from its interpretation. Okay. So they gave all the interpretation power over all articles of the basic law uh, to uh, the MPCSC. Okay. So that second judgment attracted a lot of uh, criticism also from uh, different people. I also uh, criticized their judgment at that time when it came out. And then they waited for another case, the third case, uh, that is the John Von Yun case, uh, two years, about two years later, okay, less than two years actually. So when the John Von Yun case came before that, they changed it, they Actually, I think they found the, its proper position. Okay? Because what has been decided is decided. They, they can't say they, themselves that they were wrong. Okay? So what they said is they're trying to move back a bit. They say, what we've said in the Nkhalin case and the Logonyong case are, are all correct. But the MPCSC has the general and the 
power, okay, and uh, unqualified power to interpret all articles of the basic law. But that's one thing they say in the third case. Then they further say that, but on the other hand, we, Hong Kong courts, will interpret the basic law according by using common law approach. By using common law approach. So basically they're saying, look, I will do things whatever I used to do. I will continue to do it in that way. If you don't like, you just interpret. Okay? Then through your interpretation, you can overrule my judgments, the CFS judgments. And according to some newspaper reporting uh, in which uh, Chief Justice, Justice Lee was, Chief, was interviewed, he said he had an understanding with the central government, it's the MPCSC, that the MPCSC would exercise sort of exercise sort of self-restraint in using its powerful interpretation. So I guess they, they have a sort of discussion and agreement on that, but we don't have any record uh, documents to show that, only newspaper reporting. Okay. So in this way, they basically taken back some authorities, say they will continue to interpret. Because if the central government, government adhere to its promise that not to interpret too often, then that will be fine by giving them the sort of unqualified power to interpret all articles of the basic law. Wouldn't do any harm to Hong Kong. But that's not in, written in the law. Okay. And so the, by this time, they actually uh, reached, I think, a sort of uh, taking back some uh, scope of its jurisdiction. Okay. So that's the uh, third case. But of course, later, if you, after this case, and uh, they have, uh, at this point, I'm not going to talk about it. After this case, Actually, there are the MPCSC has interpreted the basic law uh, four more times. So here are the uh, four of them. So I, I don't have time to go uh, into any details of those. Okay. But only one which has not caused any problem or debate is the fourth one. That's the interpretation of Article 13 and uh, uh, that one. So that is uh, um, the sort of immunity, like a sovereign immunity uh, case. Because that was a case in which the CFA uh, made a request to the MPCSC for its interpretation. Okay. So that followed the basic law procedure. Okay, procedure. So now, if you look at the development as far as the interpretation power is concerned, actually, the MPCSC's interpretation authority over the basic law, you can say, and its position has expanded, has expanded. Okay. And because I think partly uh, we need to, it's the CFA to blame, because it's conceded too much in the uh, Laogongyong case, the second case of on right of a boat. And later, if you look at the CFA's, no, the MPCSC's interpretation on Article, for example, the third interpretation on Article 53, which is about the term, uh, the term uh, for uh, chief, for the chief chief executive to serve, and which has nothing to do with the the you can say the central local relationship or uh, the matter purely within the jurisdiction of the central government. Okay. And some, the, the fifth, the same, Article 104. So that is a sort of, you can say, shows the, the basic law is a sort of uh, living constitution. And uh, the interpretation power though shared by the MPCSC and the Hong Kong courts. But the exact 
sharing has moved over the years after Hong Kong's return to uh, China. Okay. So that means what's within the one country's power, what's within the uh, autonomy of Hong Kong as they are, the second system has uh, changed over the years. Okay. So that's the first issue I want to uh, discuss with you. And uh, I talk a little bit about the second issue, then I will stop okay, for uh, Q&A. So second issue is uh, the constitutionality of Hong Kong independence. I, I've uh, written a paper on this. So the, this issue, actually, if you look at the whole development of uh, uh, argument for Hong Kong independence, it started with uh, some articles published in a student's journal in uh, Hong Kong U. And, uh, but that was a purely academic discussion. Okay? Didn't really attract much attention until our, uh, one of our, our chief executive at that time uh, mentioned that that was dangerous okay, to talk about Hong Kong independence. And uh, then what really caused the uh, Hong argument of Hong Kong, develop Hong Kong independence became a big issue was uh, after the 2014 uh, MPCC decision about the uh, the selection of chief executive, because at that time it was uh, the plan was to have the chief executive in Hong Kong directly elected in uh, 2017. Okay, so that was the uh, plan at that time. Okay, and uh, then the some pan Democrats members and also scholars, they want to make sure, want to impose pressure upon central government, want to make sure that there will be genuine election, direct election by through one person, one vote okay, for the chief executive. So they organized the civil disobedience. They threatened to organize the civil disobedience activity by occupying, saying, occupying central. If the central government does not agree to give Hong Kong a uh, genuine election of the chief executive. So then, but central government nevertheless issued the decision in which essentially they have a procedure of screening of the candidates okay, by the central government. They need to screen the candidates. Only those candidates screened by the central government will be uh, eligible to be formal candidates for CE. So that was uh, criticized by the uh, pan-democrats. So the three organizers all started the Occupy Central movement, which I'm sure you all have heard of it. But of course, after the central, the Occupy Central movement, central government did not give in. Okay, they didn't give in. And uh, so after the Occupy Central movement was over, and uh, clearly through, you can see in Hong Kong actually, there are more people advocate uh, Hong Kong independence. And uh, what really made the issue a public is the Hong Kong National Party. That one was actually one of many, uh, you can say, parties or organizations established by those participants uh, in the uh, Occupy Central movement. Okay. So this party, they advocated in its uh, constitution okay, that they will try to achieve Hong Kong independence through whatever means, including violence. Okay. So its registration, however, however was uh, rejected by the Hong Kong government. And uh, then later, the Secretary for Security actually banned the operation of the party. Okay. And this party and the broader case to review, uh, review the decision of the Secretary for Security to ban it. But 
that appeal was uh, rejected by the uh, chief executive in council. Okay, and so the next step at, step at that time was actually for for them to bring a case for judicial review, but at the last minute, they decided not to bring a case for judicial review. Okay, so that's the whole development. The reason I did this research actually was in anticipation of the issue might be litigated in courts. So the courts need to look at the uh, sort of comparative jurisprudence to, to decide. So that's why I did this issue, did this uh, research. And uh, I looked at it. Most people look at the issue from the sort of legality, purely legality. And I looked at the issue from the constitutional level. Okay? And uh, because if Hong Kong people have the right to uh, advocate or seek Hong Kong independence, then it's a constitutional right. So you don't need to go to the local legislation level. The constitutional right will prevail over any other thing, over any other local legislation. Okay. So that's the whole starting point. And also because there is China has zero tolerance of secession. Okay. But in Hong Kong, such an issue could be litigated and the court or our courts have to decide on it. Okay. So in the comparative study, I've looked at, uh, uh, reviewed all the constitutions around the world and uh, then chosen some to, uh, uh, to, for comparative study. There's, after reviewing the constitutional documents, you will see that some countries actually, they, their constitution include the right to secession. Not that many. Old days, there are about a dozen, but uh, recent modern constitution, only a few of them. Okay. And, but never been actually relied on in reality. And most countries' constitution are silent. No mention of it. And the uh, UK is a, uh, I also brought in for discussion, even though it did not have a written constitution because it had the uh, most recent practice of uh, request for independence or secession. Okay. I've chosen Spain, Canada, uh, United States and the UK uh, to compare because they've had a uh, practice or demand for a secession. Uh, so I quickly go through that. So if you look at the the Spanish situation, and actually it's constitution, it's a, a unitary uh, country, okay, similar to China, and the constitutional provisions are also quite similar. Uh, they relied on these two uh, constitution because of the case eventually uh, uh, came up to the, its constitutional court. Okay, so. Spanish Constitution Article 1 2 says national sovereignty belongs to the Spanish people. Okay. And uh, also, it says the Article 2 the Constitution is based on the indissoluble unity of the Spanish nation, etc. Okay. So it's indissoluble uh, unity. And uh, sovereign belongs to Spanish people. So, in that sense, whereas in the Catalan uh, secession movement, uh, in its declaration of sovereignty, they have argued that Catalonians okay, should enjoy, they enjoy the sovereignty. Okay? That's what they said uh, in the declaration. Okay? So then when the case was before the constitutional court and the constitutional court relied on this article one, two and two, says that the sovereignty only uh, belongs to uh, the Spanish people, all Spanish people. So not any uh, component okay, uh, or autonomous uh, bodies uh, within uh, Spain who will enjoy the sovereignty. So basically said they don't have their sovereignty. Okay? So therefore, because they don't have the sovereignty, then you cannot don't have the right okay, to seek the uh, secession. Okay. You can't unanimously decide to act, hold a referendum 
and then decide to uh, become independent. Okay. But one interesting thing is the constitution of court's judgment did leave a door open saying that according to current constitutional document, the Spanish constitution, you cannot, you don't have the right okay, to seek independence or secession. But you can, through lawful means, to bring your request to change the current constitution order, meaning to change the constitution itself. If you change the constitution, which then make it possible, make it constitutional to request or to seek independence or secession, then you can. So, but you need to change the constitutional document. So that's the lesson we can uh, get from the uh, Spanish uh, constitutional court's judgment. But Canada is more liberal. If you look at the Quebec uh, uh, secession uh, movement, the case, the sort of request to the uh, Supreme Court for decision uh, on this, whether the Quebec has the right to seek independence. Okay. So the, in the advisory opinion given by the uh, Canadian Supreme Court, it has said that actually a referendum can be held because it's a right to democracy. Okay. People have the right to democracy. So you can have held the referendum. But the, if the referendum result is clear that uh, majority of people are in favor of secession. That will give, the, give Quebec the right to start the negotiation with the federal government. Okay? Uh, but that does not give them an automatic right uh, to declare independence uh, unilaterally. So that's the uh, position of the Canadian Supreme Court. You give you a referendum gives you the right to start negotiation. Because they say, if you look at the legal principles, the right to democracy is not the only principle, constitutional principle in Canada. There are also federalism and various other constitutional pr principles. So those principles need to reconcile. Okay? So that's why they say uh, you cannot unilaterally declare declare uh, independence even after a majority vote in the uh, referendum. So that's somewhat, if, if you look at it, it's different from the uh, Spanish position. Then US is uh, very interesting. And if you read some literature, you will see that there are various uh, organizations in different states in the United States argue for independence uh, from time to time, okay? And uh, here I've taken two cases, and one is from the Supreme Court, uh, that I will only talk about this case, okay? So Texas against white. So if you look at the judgment from the Supreme Court in the US, they said actually very clearly that, they said Texas, after becoming one of the United States, she entered into an indissoluble relationship. Okay. So all the obligations of perpetual union attached to that, to Texas. Okay. So it's a perpetual. Once you join the union, it's perpetual. You cannot ask about to get out. Okay. You cannot revoke it. But if you look at the last sentence I highlighted, there is actually a caveat. It has, the Supreme Court has given two possibilities under which a state in the United States can become independent. One is through revolution. The other is through the consent of the states. Meaning, if you can get consent of all the other 49 states, then you can be independent. Okay. So that's possible, okay. it's possible. So that's the U.S. situation. And for the time limit, uh, time, I think I will stop uh, this one. I will just to say a few words. I, I will skip the uh, 
the UK just to come to a sort of a quick conclusion on this one. Um, issue two. So if you look at this issue, actually, if you compare, look at the international experience, and if the case does go, or one day, I don't know whether later we will be any case, go to the Hong Kong courts, and the various, those comparative uh, jurisprudence can be learned by Hong Kong because of the similarity between the Chinese constitution, the system or structure, as a unitary system with the uh, Spain, I think most likely our courts can learn from the sort of Spanish uh, uh, experience. And that's the most likely a decision that may come to, to deny the sort of uh, uh, authority or the right to seek independence okay, because of the existing constitutional provision. But it can't rule out completely that they may, if the court's majority of the judges or justices in the CFA are more liberal, they may, they can go or try to uh, follow the uh, Canadian or the US uh, approach. But the UK approach is the least des desirable in the sense that it may lead the country uh, to be broken into uh, four different uh, countries, the United Kingdom. And that's definitely, I, I don't think China would want. And also Article 23 basically says secession is a crime. So in order to make it lawful, not only the Chinese constitution actually, but also the Hong Kong basic law need to be amended before there is any chance to seek uh, Hong Kong independence. Okay, I think I'll stop here. I've already talked uh, uh, too, far too long. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin, indeed. Um, I always thought that Belgian constitutional law was complicated, uh, but I'm sure that our uh, participants today have realized that the situation between Hong Kong and China, and especially the situation with the basic law and its relation with the PRC constitution, uh, is uh, even more complicated if possible. Um, I would invite all participants to, to um, submit questions. So far, I haven't received any. Correct me if I'm wrong. There is also a raise hand function. If you click uh, the participants button, you can raise your hand. So if you have a question, please do. Uh, I'm sure Professor Lin, you've uh, given us so much information indeed. Uh, that many of us are uh, or remain um, at loss of words, I should say. But let me then uh, kick off whilst we are waiting for perhaps for some uh, questions to come in. Um, and I will go in the in the reverse in the reverse order. Um, so starting with the end of the of your presentation, start with perhaps um, a comment rather than a question, because of course. Um, the whole issue of uh, secession and the legality of independence, especially the secession part, is also uh, interesting from an international uh, law point of view. I'm uh, personally an international lawyer, and so there it is indeed quite obvious that for um, secession, at least, in international law, it is these days only recognized in the context of decolonialization processes which perhaps yes. indeed would have um, provided a basis for Hong Kong to secede from the UK uh, back in the days. But of course, with the, in the situation and contemporary situation, indeed, um, I would argue that secession from Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong uh, from China is indeed um, rather um, unlikely. Um, so that was my, my first point, so that you see that there is also an, uh, an, uh, an angle that you can consider from an international point of view in these matters. And then perhaps um, I see already one question coming in, but before I move to that, the question from the audience, I will um, take my liberty as moderator here, Professor, um, to go back to um, the cases on the uh, right of abode and Article 24 of the yes. Basic Law. Um, so you've mentioned that after the uh, NPC uh, SC uh, overruling of uh, the Nkaling case, um, that yes. the second case, so the Lao Kong Yong case, that there indeed the CFA released or, or at least um, its powers to, to the NPC SC, stating that indeed it has the power to interpret all of the articles of the basic law in an unqualified and, and general way. 
Now, my question there is, could you perhaps um, shed some light on how the decision came about, if you have that information? Was that based on, on the overruling of the decision by the NPCSC itself? Um, and how was the CFA then influenced uh, in that process? Had perhaps the chief executive um, a role to play? Uh, you mentioned in the final case then that there might have been some sort of understanding between the chief executive and the central government in Beijing. But I was wondering, considering the, the, the extensive scope and how heavily the decision in the Lao Kongyun case was criticized, whether you perhaps could shed some light on, on what the, the driving factors, the dynamics were in the adoption of that decision. All right, okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. There, the second case, and if you look at the, if you read the uh, Nkalin judgment and also the interpretation of the, uh, by the NPCSC of Article 24 and 22, uh, or the first interpretation, and you will see that actually the NPCSC, what it has overruled is the judgment itself. They say the MPCS, the CFA misinterpreted the original legislative intent behind article of Article 24. So that's what they've done. But then the, the second case, the, the uh, Laogongyong case, because the CFA has already stated out, which I didn't have time to go into, that in the Nkalin case, they have actually set out the criteria when they should seek an interpretation and uh, what articles uh, the NPCSC uh, should, it, when the NPCSC should interpret, which basically is a narrow approach. NPCSC the interpretation power is limited to those matters on the paragraph three of Article 158 of the Basic Law. But then, now they've interpreted, so they need to give a judgment to say, look, unless they resigned at that time, they didn't resign, they, they decided to continue. So then they want to show that they need to give a proper explanation that the interpretation of MPCSC and the Nkalin case can coexist as far as the interpretation authority is concerned. Mm -hmm. So how, how to give us such a sort of interpretation? So that's what they did in the Nkalin. Oh, sorry, in the Laogongyong case. Mm -hmm. So by recognizing you have the, um, the NPCSC has uh, the power in unqualified and uh, general authority. Mm -hmm. So they, they go back to rely on Article 158, Paragraph 1, saying that article has actually given the sort of general and unqualified power to the NPCSC to interpret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because through other articles, they can't explain. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, I don't think the chief executive would have uh, any role to play. It didn't, it, or he dare not. And I don't think it's executive there to intervene in this situation. Mm -hmm. Most likely it's a sort of uh, discussion between uh, the chief executive. That's my speculation. I don't have evidence for it. Mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, officials or middlemen uh, representing the uh, MPCSC or from the Supreme People's Court, some, somebody should be a middleman there to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. And then basically, I recognize your authority, but you will restrain your you will limit behave, basically, you, you wouldn't interpret too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah, indeed, that clarifies a lot. Thank you very much, Professor. And then there was a question uh, that came in from uh, Katarina. Uh, yes. And I will just uh, rephrase here. And she actually asks for your look into the future. 
Um, and in particular, she wonders what your expectations are for the year 2047 and afterwards when the 50 year period ends, of course. And she asks whether Hong Kong in your projections will maintain its high degree of autonomy. Right, okay. Actually, a few years ago, I wrote on a paper on it, I think two or three years ago. My assessment is, I think, uh, I'm quite confident that the one country, two systems will continue and Hong Kong will continue to enjoy a high degree of autonomy. The, a few reasons. The first reason is if you look back to what Deng Xiaoping said about 50 years at that time, and uh, there were people, reporters, did ask him the question, what will happen after 50 years? And his answer was, maybe 50 years later, Hong Kong, China will be the same as Hong Kong. So you, there's no need for you to change your system. And the other reason is more uh, legal, I would say, is in order to change the, abolish the, uh, the Hong Kong system, to, to make Hong Kong to implement and Chinese system, that will take decades to implement. And that one, I made a comparison, a comparative study with the British implementation of its system in Hong Kong. Because the British in the 1840s, they said how all British laws will be applied to Hong Kong. But in reality, they only applied English law in in I think more than five decades time to those foreign traders in Hong Kong. Local residents still apply the uh, uh, traditional Chinese law and the Qing uh, codes. Mm. So it's a way, it's uh, many, many decades later, the British law actually gradually expanded to be applicable to local uh, residents even though on paper it said from the very beginning it's applicable. So Hong Kong now with the judges, lawyers, most of them don't know Chinese law at all or only a very tiny little bit. So you need time to train people if you want to implement another legal system. There's no such preparation at all. And also of course there's another third last reason I can put forward is it won't do any good to China to, to expand the Chinese system to Hong Kong. Because as far as the legal system is concerned, Hong Kong's legal system is still uh, better, you can say, as far as the quality of it is concerned, it enjoys a higher reputation okay, in international society. There's an, I don't see any reasonable senior leader would replace this system with the Chinese system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for uh, sharing that with us. And then there's an, um, another question, but which actually is comprised of, of several sub questions, I would say, uh, from uh, Willem Possemich, who's actually a colleague of mine at KU Leuven from the Institute of Comparative Law. Um, and I'll just uh, submit the questions all together to you because they are indeed related. Um, sure. And he asks whether, uh, or his question relates uh, mainly to, to Macau, in the sense that he asks whether okay. Macau usually or generally adheres more to the Chinese position or to the Hong Kong position, because he points out that indeed often the views between Hong Kong uh, and, and China on, on certain matters are not the same. So he asks where uh, Macau stands on this spectrum, whether it tends to, to follow more Hong Kong or rather uh, the mainland Chinese uh, positions. Um, as a second part of that question, he asks whether the Macau basic law um, has uh, been interpreted by the NPCSC before or whether the problem there does not exist so with the Macau basic law. And then finally he asks uh, whether the interpretations of the Hong Kong basic law 
are also applied to the Macau basic law. So those were his, uh, I would say, three uh, questions. Okay, thank you uh, for the questions. The first one is for Macau, actually, is not an issue uh, in China. There's a, they adhere more to, for, they don't argue with the central government, put it in this way. Or the, they, they also have the opposition party there, but the number is very small. And uh, the majority of residents in Macau, they, they don't oppose the sort of approach taken by China. More or less, they follow it. And also, I think there are some other reasons. For example, if you look at the officials uh, in the uh, Macau uh, government, and many are migrants, many of them, from mainland China. So there's a sort of, a, there's no mental opposition to the sort of uh, uh, positions taken by the mainland Chinese government. So that's to the first one. The second question is Macau basic law. Sorry, I, I forgot a bit, Macau. Uh, the second question was whether the Macau basic law has been interpreted by the NPCSC uh -huh. before or whether the problem is not present with the Macau basic law as it is with the Hong Kong basic law. These uh, questions uh, have not arisen in the Macau case. And uh, I, I don't know whether they've interpreted. I, I can't recall any, but I haven't done comprehensive research on the Macau Basic Law. Uh, but there's one difference is, actually, because Macau Basic Law was enacted two years later than Hong Kong's. So there, there's some legislative improvement, actually, in Macau's uh, legislation, uh, Macau Basic Law, compared to Hong Kong. I've read a couple of articles uh, on, on that. So, so most of, for example, the Hong Kong independence is not an issue there. And uh, so Macau seems much better. Central government used Macau as an example, asking Hong Kong to learn from Macau. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's possible to, because uh, not comparable to in many aspects. And Hong Kong basic law interpretations, uh, whether there can be uh, in, in, how should I say, in the, in scholarly research, of course, we, there are many similar provisions, so we, are, we will compare. But Macau system is different. It's a more close to European continental system. So it's different from ours. I, don't think the uh, I think on the sort of human rights protection part, possibly they can make reference to our judgments. On many others, they may not. Whereas our courts on constitutional matters, they will actually refer to or make reference to all constitutional ju judgments in the world. So if Hong Kong, Macau has good judgments and our courts can refer to them, yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. And then um, I guess a final question because we're running uh, out of time indeed. Uh, a question yeah. from Ina and from what I take, um, it is a bit of a clarification to a point you've touched upon in the context mm. of, uh, again, we go back to it, uh, the Lao Kung Yung case. Um, yes. And she uh, writes, it says that a power of interpretation of the NPCSC is not restricted by paragraph 2 and 3 of Article 158 of the Constitution. And that mm -hmm. following, uh, or given that rather, uh, the NPCSC has a general power of interpretation. And she continues that local courts can, however, interpret provisions within the limits of their authority. And then comes her actual question. Is it possible that the court, uh, so I'm assuming uh, the, in this case, the court of first uh, uh, final appeal, I would say, um, gives an interpretation or the local court within these limits, but then at the same time, the NPCSC decides to give an interpretation as well, because it has the general power to do so. And if so, does the NPCSC's interpretation overrule the one of the Hong Kong uh, court? 
Right. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So this one, there are a couple of points to make. The first is the uh, depends on how you interpret this uh, the relationship between the first three paragraphs of Article uh, 158. So one view is what I've said: the 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 power has been limited by the uh, paragraph three. Uh, two and three. And another view is what uh, you've just mentioned, uh, uh, as the question uh, has mentioned. It's not limited. By delegating the, or granting the power doesn't mean the power has been deprived or the NPCSC has been deprived of the power to interpret. Mm -hmm. So there are different views on this. Okay. And uh, then the, the real question part is actually the dilemma Hong Kong now faces. With now, the MPCSC has interpreted the basic law in three different situations. One, the first case is after the CFS judgment. Okay? And then in, there's a second category of uh, interpretation is actually the most recent one, the fifth interpretation. Was, was actually, interpretation was made why the case was uh, still in the process of adjudication. It was, uh, the hearing was finished, but the judgment was not delivered yet. So during that period, the interpretation, the fifth interpretation was given. And uh, the third scenario was, before any case, the, uh, there was a case brought to the court, but before the court started the case, trial of the case, uh, the NPCSC issued its interpretation. In all three scenarios, actually, the NPCSC has been criticized by some people in Hong Kong. But then the Chinese scholars' view was that, look, in, you recognize, the CFA recognizes the NPCSC's authority or power to interpret, but I can't interpret it after your judgment, nor can I interpret before, nor in between. So when can I interpret? So the, my answer will be, if the NPC, the CFA or Hong Kong courts recognizes, which is, is its official position, the NPCSC has the sort of uh, unqualified general power to interpret, then when it will exercise that authority under the Chinese law, there's no limit, no restriction. So they can interpret it at any time. But once its interpretation is given, it will be binding. It will be part of, treated as part of the basic law, will be binding on Hong Kong courts. I don't know whether I've explained it clearly. I'll, uh, I guess I'll, I'll uh, revert back to Ina right away. Ina, uh, I hope this answers your question. If not, uh, give us a shout, be it by uh, raising your hand uh, or, or uh, through another way. Um, if not, uh, I, I see uh, it's already uh, six past the hour. Ina lets me know, Professor, that you've answered her question very clearly. So uh, I think we're good to go. Um, so uh, our time's run out. Um, I would like to thank uh, the audience for being here. I'd like to thank the participants for their questions. Uh, but most of all, Professor uh, Lin, I would like to thank you for making time in uh, your schedule at this time of day as well um, to share your views uh, with us. It is very much appreciated. Um, I wish everyone uh, all the best and a very good day. And uh, Professor, thank you very much once again. And I hope to be in touch soon. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye.